Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Are you feeling? Are you feeling fully hydrated, caffeinated? I'm afraid we're a few hours off wine o'clock, but I hope that you've had a chance to meet some new people, start some cool conversations, and I know that we're going to be generating a few more with this panel, which is called the Future of Transparency. <laughs> I'm Claire Press. I'm Vogue Australia's sustainability editor at large. Although I'm starting to wonder if I wouldn't rather be called transparency editor. <laughs> it's certainly like the word du jour. It's a, a buzzword, the concept that everybody's talking about. And I'm sure that many of you were present at this morning's panel that looked at the issue of transparency from the perspective of supply chains. Today, we're going to be looking at it now from the consumer perspective. And we're going to be focusing on how we can communicate this idea to the fashion fan and the shopper. How much do they care? And what are the challenges of putting forward meaningful information to them that they can really understand? Uh, there will be a chance to ask some questions at the end, I hope, if we go all right for time. So please do use the app to put forward your questions. Now, I'm going to just dive straight in and ask our esteemed panelists just to very briefly outline their position on transparency and what it means to them. I'm going to start with you, Baptiste Carrière Pradal. I've been practicing that. <laughs> Vice President of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Transparency, what does that mean to you? Yeah, that means for, for us, transparency really means um, systematic disclosure of information, environmental and social, all across the value chain for factory, brand, and product, so that we have ultimately transparency with intent. Fantastic. OK, Paul Van Sale. Transparency, what does it mean to you at Myat, as CEO of Myat? How important is this to what you do there? I think transparency, every company in the world uh, in the 21st century has a responsibility to try and do good and have a positive social impact. And transparency is the means by which you measure um, both to yourselves, but also to every one of your constituencies and communities, whether you live up to that promise. OK, living up to that promise. I like it. Rachel Arthur, Chief Intelligence Officer of The Current. What does, talk to me about that word transparency. How do you define it? I think for me, I'm probably a little bit different to most people in this room and I spend the majority of my time in, in technology and there the idea, as Bill said on the last panel, of open source is very normal, right? This idea that we will willingly share information, share things with other people across the industry. So transparency to me has two different perspectives. It's around how do we be more open for the sake of our consumers, but also how do we be more collaborative with the industry at large? Open, collaborative, love it. Carrie Summers, founder, co-founder, and chief operations officer of Fashion Revolution. Transparency is really core to what you do at FashRev. It, it is, and I think for us it's really important that that disclosure is public. So it's the public disclosure of credible, comparable, and comprehensive information about suppliers and supply chain practices. And we believe that greater transparency will lead to accountability, and eventually that will lead to a change in the way in which business is done. And transparency alone doesn't represent the sort of structural, systemic shift that we want to see happen within the fashion industry, but transparency it does help to reveal those structures which are in place so that we can better understand how to change them. Have to start there. And last but not least, Karen Brink, Chief Sustainability Manager for Arquette. What does that word transparency mean for Arquette and for you, Karen? Um, I mean, for us, it's been really um, a central principle when we started Arquette. Um, it's very much about being open and being generous about the information. Uh, and, and, and disclosing, of course, the supply chain uh, part that we can disclose. But also, um, we, I guess we, we look at it with also enriching our products with other um, information like the design process or other things also. OK, good stuff. And we're going to get on exact to exactly how you communicate that, because it's actually very interesting. But I want to start with you, Baptiste. Let's talk about the HIG index. Now, I'm sure that many of you are aware of what the HIG index is in this room here today, and that it's a cornerstone of what the Sustainable Apparel Coalition does. But if you could just give us a brief overview and then get into the nitty gritty of where is it at in 2018 and where do you see it's headed in the future, please? Yes, so I will try to be brief indeed for that. 
So virtually the Hig Index is uh, created as a, a suite of tools which aim is to evaluate the social and the environmental performance of each of the components of the value chain. I mentioned earlier indeed that if we want to have transparency, it has to be for factory, brand and product. So therefore the Hig Index is a start by self-assessment where a brand, a factory or a product designer will be able to uh, answer information relative to environmental and social performance of a factory, a brand, a product. And on top of that, what we also have is we have verification and other elements that make sure that the element indeed that will be communicated will be comparable and meaningful, as you mentioned earlier. So that's virtually the, the Hig Index and how it works. It's simple. The self-assessment lives on a kind of a LinkedIn um, platform, Hig.org, where everybody, every factory has a profile, every brand has a profile, so the information can be shared uh, from all across the different players of the value chain. So that's virtually what the Hig Index. And virtually at the end of the year, what we will have is that we are revamping completely our suite of tools. And by the end of the year, we have a new tool to measure environmental performance of factory that we have also worked together with ADAC. We will have a new tool to measure social performance of factory that we are creating with a social and labor convergence project. So with many other organizations like SEDEX, ILO, to work on this uh, tool. With a brand module, we are doing also a collaborative effort to have a way, again, to measure brand performance uh, together with Dutch government, Textile Bundes, I mean, national platform that allows for that to happen. This is so valuable for industry players, but I want to ask, as we're thinking about the consumer, where are we at with that? And obviously, this information is not yet available to the fashion fan. No, that's, that's a fair point, because indeed, the, the, the information we have today, there is a lot of data points. It's very complex. So again, if we want to have this information which is communicated in a meaningful way, meaning, meaningful way what we'll be working on is how can we aggregate 200 data points into a much smaller amount of them so that that can be vehicled and transmitted to consumers and other players so that they can make the most of it and that can ultimately um, change their purchasing decision. So is so, that coming? Yeah, well, that's coming. That's coming indeed. That's in the pipeline. So when? the team is working hard on it and all our members are working hard on it. And in the next years, we will be able to have some deployment of some of those elements. Great. I look forward to that. That's cool. So am I. Yeah. <laughs> Harry, I want to just jump onto you there and ask you, wearing your Fashion Revolution hat, what other tools are out there and what are the limitations? So from, from a consumer perspective, yes, the Higg Index sounds fabulous, but if we can't see it, what, what as a shopper can we look to to find out more about the transparency of brands that we're shopping from? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a number of tools out there. I mean, there's the Fashion Transparency Index, which was published in April. There's other indices like Behind the Barcode, Rank a Brand. There's a number of apps like Good On You, Not My Style. And then there's also um, tools which will address specific issues, such as the NRDC's website, which maps factories in, in China and the pollution um, which they're emitting in real time. But I think I can really see two clear areas of limitation. The first is that just because these tools and indices exist, it doesn't mean that people are necessarily going to use them. There's a whole raft of websites out there which are designed to show people sort of better, cheaper, faster internet or mobile phone suppliers, but many people just choose to stick with, with what they know and not to change, even in the face of, of really compelling information to do otherwise. And secondly, really, these tools and apps are only as good as the information which is put into them. And what we really need to do is to incentivize brands to publish more meaningful information. In the Fashion Transparency Index, published in April, um, we found that 55 brands were disclosing their environmental goals. Only 35% sort of of brands, only 37% of brands were disclosing their human rights goals, and only about half of brands were disclosing the progress that they're making towards those goals on an annual basis and even then mostly on the environmental side and not on the human rights side. So really as consumers we have no way of knowing whether brands' policies and procedures are really effective and whether they're driving change for the people making our clothes. You think there's too much emphasis on we're using green light bulbs? I think there's definitely too much em emphasis on that and we need to have clear goals and we need to have clear progress towards those goals and that's why we need to have industry-wide, comprehensive, comparable um, standards, which, which all brands sign up to. Just before I move on to Rachel, just on the Fashion Transparency Index 2018, how are we doing with that? Because I think that the average score was 21%. Is that right? 
Yes, I mean, we're certainly seeing improvements in some areas. So, for instance, um, we're seeing the publication of, of factory lists. For instance, 37% of brands are now publishing their Tier 1 factory lists um, compared to 12.5% two years ago. So, we're certainly seeing some improvements. Mm. Where are some of our spotlight issues, you know, looking at women, looking at issues like waste, looking at living wages? There's still a lot that needs to be done. Okay, Rachel. Coming at this from your focus as a journalist, as a consultant who has worked with brands including Gucci and Ralph Lauren um, and Shiseido, I believe, your work is about understanding market trends, understanding consumer behaviour. How much do customers actually care about this? How likely is it that customers are going to read these reports, seek out these apps? And, and I suppose, do you think that we're seeing more interest from consumers from a brand value perspective? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's really interesting, right? All of us in this room are in here because we already are engaged with this subject, as, as we heard this morning, you know, that sort of we are already preaching to the converted to a certain extent. And I think it's really interesting when you start thinking about, about your consumer. And of course, there are going to be a subset who are interested in sustainability, who are interested in transparency and want to know where things have come from. But it is still a subset. And even if we are seeing that trajectory increase, I can guarantee that the majority of your consumers are not sat there saying, you know what, I really want to understand your supply chain. They're just not. They just want to have nice product at the end of the day. That said, a lot of the work that we do, is, as you said, is around really understanding market trends and, and how they're shifting. And as I said at the beginning, you know, we come from innovation and a technology point of view, but it's never about technology for the sake of technology. It's around how can you integrate that kind of innovation so as to move your business forward. And what's really interesting when you do that, you know, we're here and we talk a lot about the what, and the what in this case is transparency. And we, we need to stop and think about the why. And so from a consumer point of view, when we're looking now for, at market trends, you kind of have to go right back. As I said, it's not about can I understand your supply chain better, but it is about the fact that consumers across the board fundamentally have this real sense of unease. You know, there's an uncertainty across the market. There's political, economical unrest. Obviously, you look in, in the West, particularly at the moment, and I know we're going to talk about trust a little bit in a moment, but, but fundamentally there, we're in quite a broken society in that way. And as a result, what we're seeing is consumers that really are fundamentally wanting something that helps support their values and, and mirror them, reflect them even. And we can talk about that in all sorts of different ways that it's, that it's materializing. But, but fundamentally, underneath it does come back to this idea of trust and this, this need for it. And that's what's something that brands can start thinking about. If we start instilling trust rather than thinking, how can I show you my supply chain? And of course, that's a way that you can do it. That's the how. But if you think about the why first, the why comes down to this idea of kind of bringing it back to actually what is the consumer need in the first place? And I think if we always go back to that fundamental um, focus, excuse me, then we're going to be more successful um, ultimately commercially. So how much do consumers care? I mean, I know that we, we read reports saying that millennials are the most value-driven generation yet. What's your fe feeling there? And do you have any, any stats that you can share that really give us a glimpse into how much customers are caring in 2018 and beyond? So from a trust perspective, we can see something like the Edelman Trust Barometer. That's been on a straight line decline for 25 years. So our trust in um, you know, governments, in banks, in institutions across the board is, is, is through the floor, which will not surprise anybody in this room, I'm sure. What we are starting to see change slightly is this, um, this focus on brands and on CEOs that stand for something. And that's increasing. People are starting to trust more. They want to see a brand that stands for something. So if you look at somebody like Patagonia, obviously has stood up against Trump with the, with the national monuments in the US. Um, and that's obviously done phenomenally well. And then you can take that all the way up to luck luxury as well, you know, Gucci standing for, for gun, gun reform as another example. But it only works for some brands, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, arguably, you know, not everybody in the room can, can sort of become an activist as a brand. But you can think about fundamentally what does that mean in terms of consumer need. And if it is about trust, um, you know, your version of doing that can indeed be using multiples of these tools that are out there. Um, and then it just comes down to storytelling and the way that you, the, the way that you actually engage with the consumer. We're going to talk a bit more about trust actually further on, but I do just want to bring in Karin here. Um, let's talk about values. If customers are looking for brands that espouse their values, what are we doing with our cap? Because there's this real driving force to the strategy that's about transparency and about being really clear about the origins of materials. Talk to us a little bit about how you're doing that with our cap. How are you communicating that information? And also, how do you choose it? 
Um, <clears throat> when, we, when we started ARCET, we really wanted to uh, find uh, a way to um, tell a lot about our products, because they are really at the core of our brand. And um, we thought that it was quite a natural part uh, launching 2017 to, um, to be as transparent as we could. Uh, it's expected from our customers. It's also part of the strategy of the group we are part of. Uh, but also another part for us was that we have really, we, we put a lot of value in our uh, relationships with our suppliers. We are very proud of them and we are happy to uh, talk about them. So that was, those were the kind of drivers for us to try and find a way to be transparent. And um, if the next question is about how we do it, uh, we um, uh, online in the, sorry, that's yes? Oh no, yes. please. <laughs> in the online store that we have, um, we uh, have a systematic transparency talking about, back to what you were mentioning, uh, which is that we have on our products a uh, simple um, mention of where our products are made, uh, by which supplier and in which factory. So that's what we call more of the systematic approach. And then we have another layer, which is more an added value of transparency to our storytelling. So uh, we uh, are happy to uh, talk uh, a lot, again, online about our products, how they are made, the history of an iconic garment, uh, but also about the suppliers that have helped us uh, make them. And um, there we go much more into depth. Uh, and we kind of, um, here I would say that the, the transparency part of that was that we were very clear from the start that we wanted to be able to nominate the supplier that we were making a story about. So um, that was kind of a, a prerequisite to, to, uh, to choose which suppliers we would uh, write about. So those are the two dimensions. I looked online and there's a lot of information. It's deep and it's, um, there's a lot of it to wade through. But if you're interested, you really can go quite far back into, OK, this material comes from here, this trim comes from here, this factory works in this place, it meet the maker. But I went in the store and I did actually buy a T-shirt because it was hot here and I wasn't expecting it. I bought it because it was organic cotton and I thought that I trusted the supplier. But that information is not in the shop, so no. it was a little bit harder. I know. Um, so um, there are several, I mean, again, um, this is a bit of the start. We are a bit of a new baby. We open actually uh, in August, so we are just getting started. Um, and this was a bit of the first step. Um, Maybe it's also part of the fact that we kind of see our physical store and our online store as really complementary interfaces. Uh, and we didn't want to kind of add a lot of material on our physical products in the store and kind of expected that our customers are today um, also so much uh, using the digital interface that with the product ID that we have, it's very easy to uh, look up the, the, the garments that you're actually looking at and find that information there. So that's, that's one of the, the reasons why it's not on the, the product. Um, and also, uh, it was also more pragmatic um, question of being sure of, you know, the, the information. And that's something that we can do much more online than on labels in, uh, on the products. Now, I didn't test this and I didn't actually ask anyone in the store to tell me all the information about the T-shirt I was buying and I should have, I'm sorry. But is that yes. part of it? Are you making sure that the staff are actually fully aware and educated about the origins of everything they're selling? I mean, when we talk about... Con yes when we talk about communicating this stuff to the consumer, is the point of sale not really important as well? Uh, we, we made sure that, uh, at least we're trying to make sure that our stuff, now your guys are going to, to uh, have to try our stuff then in a, in a market store, but that they know that if anyone would actually ask the question, who made mm -hmm. this dress, mm -hmm. uh, they know where to find this information on our site. So they should be the one that the first hand that you can go to and, and ask. And, and talking about you know, the, 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 the importance of trust, and someone was saying that in the panel this morning, and for us, the customers are, of course, super important, but uh, our staff is as important. Uh, and, and really building the trust with, with them is something that we see a lot of value in, in, in that um, area.
Okay, good stuff. Paul, I want to bring you in and ask you about, we're talking about storytelling and communicating messages mm. to the consumer. Mayette was founded on this idea of beautiful storytelling about artisanal, authentic, beautifully produced product. Let's talk a bit about the challenges that you face with that and how you go about telling the stories and how are the customers going to really trust and know that those stories are true? Right. <clears throat> well, I think we started with this idea of trying to say, how do you assist artisans? And I think one of the things we started with is somewhat of a blank slate. And I think the kind of premise is that you should start by asking, not by, by telling or by presupposing, by getting up alongside people and trying to understand the objective circumstances in which they live. And for that reason, we partnered with a not-for-profit not -for organization called Nest. Um, and that was a very interesting journey because trying to triangulate a set of artisans who had the requisite skills, but who were also interested in having their products taken to the next level, and then interested in going on that journey alongside us. So, you know, if you come back to the, the, the premise of the panel talking about transparency, I think the first thing you have to do is kind of transparency of intention. What are you trying to do in relation to the communities you're trying to work with? Do you pause and listen to them and ask them what they want as opposed to imposing upon them what you think they want? And then do you get up alongside them and try and develop programs that um, provide that level of assistance? Um, then you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to say, you know, am I succeeding? And it's always useful to do that as an internal matter, but it's also helpful to have a kind of third party who you can have a dialogue with and say, you know, when we're not here with our checkbooks, you know, placing an order, what are the artisans saying? What is this relationship like? Is it a productive relationship for them? And then what are the objective challenges? Because again, when you're trying to do something really difficult, like trying to deliver dignity in circumstances which are hard and challenging, um, there's trial and error, and it's hard, and it's complicated, and it involves trade-off. Um, and so to be able to have a kind of triangulation between artisans, between the brand, and between a kind of development partner sl slash NGO, which keeps everybody both honest and transparent, but also says, you know, this will take time, and you know, we're going to work on it, um, is a really important part of it. It's by its nature, so you have to be... Yeah, I think that anybody who tells you that trying to achieve good in fashion is simple, linear, and uncomplicated is, has not been in fashion. Um, so I think starting from the outset of saying it's going to be complicated, um, but not using that, that complication as a crutch or as an evasion of responsibility, but really to say, how do you work at it in a systematic way is very important. Carrie, I feel like you're itching to join this conversation because of your other role with Patrick Uti, and I wonder if you might like to leap in there and talk a little bit about some of the learnings that you took from your supply chain mapping and mm -hmm. from becoming certified by the World Trade let me get that right. Can you say it for me? World Fair Trade Organization. Yes, I, mean, I, I no longer work in Patch Cootie on a daily basis, but before I founded Fashion Revolution for the past two decades, I was working, I founded Patch Cootie, and we work with artisans, mostly in Ecuador, on the design and production of Panama hats. And we piloted two different WFTO Fair Trade certifications. And we also piloted the Geo Fair Trade project, we were the only non-commodity sort of composite product, all of the rest of them were foodstuffs. And this really brought about an unprecedented level of traceability and transparency to our supply chain. So we gathered 68 different social, economic and environmental indicators across three years. We mapped our carbon and water footprints for the Panama hats. And then we also traced the GPS coordinates of each weaver's house. And this isn't easy information because they're high in the Andes, only 40 25% of them are accessible by road. And we then traced the straw back to the GPS coordinates of the weaving association, of the processing associations of the straw, and then to the plots of land where the straw grows um, in the coastal, coastal cloud forest. And of course, the Panama hat weavers are really delighted that now they can trace Panama hats back to the country of origin, Ecuador. Mm. 
Um, but unfortunately, most brand CSR initiatives only have very marginal impact on those lower levels of the supply chain. Um, we found in the Fashion Transparency Index that only one brand, ASOS, was mapping its raw material suppliers, and only 18% of brands are mapping their processing facilities. Right. And so, you know, they really have very little, little impact on those lower reaches and don't really know what happens there. And a lot of the tools that exist are very top-down in their approach, so they exist more to assure the brand's sort of reputation and compliance rather than existing to have a positive impact on the artisans. And what Patch Cootie has been trialling is very much a, sort of a more bottom-up approach. So even at the moment, Patch Cootie is working on a sort of new generation of tools which are much more visual, they're inclusive, they're digital tools. So a lot of, most of the artisans um, that we work with haven't even completed primary education, even at management level. So it's important that they're using you know, sort of symbols, visual diagrams, emoticons, pictures, and so that this is something which is really accessible and inclusive for all of the artisans, and this can enable them to map, to assess, to generate feedback, and then to assure compliance with, with codes of conduct, but in, in a really inclusive format. Rachel, I want to bring you in there just talking about tech and about what sort of tools we do have available to make this information more interesting and more consumable by consumers. Do you want to talk to me a little bit about that, how tech can facilitate better communication in this space? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting is that we're at this sort of crunch time where we know we need to do it, and it's around how do we some, somehow unify what's out there and make it sort of very viable across the board. And as I said at the beginning, this, this idea of sort of the consumer that is sort of untrusting in this kind of alternative facts era, let alone the sort of Facebook Cambridge Analytica stuff that's going on, it makes it very hard to kind of come up with something that everybody's going to fundamentally believe in. Um, and, and so there's that balance to be had. And, you know, this idea of storytelling and, and, and you know, putting information out there is, 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 is brilliant and works really, really well, but you still have to get the customer over the line to sort of get to it in the first place. Um, and I think what we are starting to see, and this was mentioned in the last panel, is that sort of the evolution of blockchain technology and where that's moving. Um, and I think, that, I think that is going to have a really, really big impact fundamentally in the space it, down the line, not, not at this point. The use case is very nascent, and the use cases that are out there are um, minimal, um, but I think it's moving forward. One sentence summation of what blockchain does? Yes, I knew you were <laughs> going to ask me that. Um, so the, the easiest way of explaining blockchain for, the, for, for everybody in the audience is essentially a digital ledger. Um, it makes it immutable by the very notion of the fact that it is decentralized. So, so what that means is that information that is stored on the blockchain by its very nature has to be true and it can't be tampered with. So the, the, the reason for that across the industry is that obviously anything that we're putting on there, if you know, the customer is able to look from an authentication perspective, from a sustainability perspective, it's, it's verified that it is real. And obviously we know that there are fundamental problems around you know, everything from organic cotton all the way up to know actually what of that is real. Mm. And so there's a, there's a huge opportunity with blockchain um, to, to sort of verify all of that going in. Now that needs a lot of other tools around it to, to truly verify what's going on there in the first place is real. Um, but you, know, you, you only need to go downstairs to look at some of the, some of the startups that are in, in the innovation um, room to see, to see some of the very exciting stuff that is being built that can fundamentally change all of this. Thank you. I'm mindful that the time is galloping away. <laughs> Batiste, do you think that, how are you looking at blockchain as an opportunity? Are you looking at ways in which, for instance, the Higg Index may be able to work with blockchain? But also, before we began this conversation, um, when we were prepping for this session, you did say that you would agree with what we were suggesting, that maybe fashion has got a bit of a trust issue. It's not the most trusted industry out there. And we do, sitting here on this panel, have an obligation to address and acknowledge that. <laughs> what do you think? Look there were definitely, you know, that was a conversation in the preparation call, and normally what's discussed in the preparation call stay in the preparation call, but I'm very happy to, mm. you know, to come back on this point. So first, the blockchain, what we do on the blockchain, we indeed look at the blockchain, and I think you clearly said that the blockchain also can be seen a bit like an armored car, and the, all, the role of the organization is to make sure that the data that will go in this kind of safe pipeline will be trusted and accurate. That's virtually what we first want to concentrate on, and then the blockchain can help to secure and to vehicle this information to the consumer in a 
safe way. But first, we have so much to do to make sure that the information coming in the pipeline is accurate. So we want to concentrate on that. And in the next years, indeed, we keep an eye on the blockchain to help us accelerate the movement. That's one thing. But now, indeed, coming back to the trust issue, um, it, it came back also on the way that we have been also talking about our sustainability effort in the past. So earlier, there was a panel showing, indeed, a, a timeline on transparency that started uh, the, century, uh, uh, the last century, virtually, on this roadmap to transparency. And what we've been doing so far is that the initial step on, on how to communicate about sustainability performance was a lot through sustainability reports and things like that. And hordes of communication experts and legal team came and created uh, reports that were aiming to show that we are moving towards more sustainable uh, as an industry. And for years after years, in the 2000, at the beginning of the 2000 and 2010, it came, it came, and then bam, the Rena Plaza happened, where suddenly we were kind of facing a gap between we've been trying to project an image of an industry moving towards more sustainability, while though we have so much real issues still in our supply chain. So therefore, this has created indeed um, a challenge about our credibility as an industry. So now we have indeed to be very careful about what we'll be saying in the next term. For instance, also this morning, there was a statement that transparency would, prevent, would um, make Rena Plaza not happen anymore. If I may, um, with all of the respect to the panelists, I disagree completely with a statement like that, because that may give the image again that transparency can be a silver bullet that can solve all of the problem, while transparency may have prevented or may have uh, reduced the likelihood of this to happen, may have tempered with the aftermath of it, but will have in no way made sure that something like that could not happen. So the step forward for us are clear that transparency indeed, if we want to regain trust as an industry, we first need to make sure that Exactly, actually, following like the, uh, the Pulse report. The Pulse report, first statement, we have a 38% of an industry. 38%, that's, I don't know, that's below average. That's not, uh, the average is poor, and we are not performing well. So therefore, that's a very clear message first that we have to state. As an industry, we have so much to do to go towards sustainability. And then also, we have to make sure that um, we go towards much more public commitments, towards what are we are going to do next. next. For instance, there is indeed, with the GFA and the CEO agenda, clear statements which are made. And we need to be sure that all of the transparency, all what we will be transparent about, will help demonstrate that we are achieving what we have promised we will be achieving in the future. So that years after years, we can regain trust and people can again consider our industry as an industry trustworthy to be able to go towards a more sustainable future. But we're going to need carrot and stick in order to be able to do that, right? Sorry? We're going to need carrot and stick. That probably doesn't translate into the French. But we're going to need not just the goodwill of brands saying, we're going to go out there and do a better job. We're also going to need better regulation, I would imagine. So there is a lot of conversation happening right now with a legislator and other person. And so far, let's try first to see how far the industry can go and how far we can move forward. And really? we can keep the dialogue open. Okay. Indeed, my aim and the aim of the coalition is virtually to dream of a, sit of a situation in which in the near future, in a few years, we will have the systematic uh, transparency that mm. we talked about. And if that doesn't happen naturally, then let's mm. talk about other means. I'm so mindful of the time galloping away. You sit here and you see it go down, down, down. I want to talk about regulation, but I do just want to bring Paul back in and ask you about transparency and how, before we started this conversation, you said, I don't want to be the sage sitting up there with all the answers. I have lots of questions. And one of the questions you raised was, should we not be expanding this definition of transparency to be addressing, I guess, more elephants in the room, for example, overproduction? Do you want to talk to me a little bit about that? Um... Well, yeah, so just based on my experience, we, you know, we, we've, um, when we started the journey of Mayet, we would be approached perhaps once every three months by a brand who was wanting to perhaps partner with us or collaborate with us. Two or three years in, it started to be once a month. Three or four years in, it started to be once a week. And in the last two years, we've been had this, as the community of, of ethical and sustainable brands have grown, we've really built a community. And in our store in New York, we've built a collective of brands, um, 12 or 13 of whom are all selling in one space, um, uh, you know, under a Mayette umbrella. Um, and that has been such a success that we're poised to do 50 brands in London on Conduit Street. Mm -hmm. um, and bring together a really amazing group of people, you know, nestled between Savile Row and New Bond Street, trying to bring a really strong ethical community and, and sustainable community of fashion brands together. 
And one of the things that's been interesting about that is to look at the kind of common themes and challenges and struggles that each of those brands is confronting. Um, and if you're working with artisans, you have a constant set of challenges about making sure that you give people dignity, that you pay people properly, that you have good quality, good supply chain. Um, if you're in the tech space, which is increasingly we're seeing a whole community of brands inventing their way around sustainable challenges, um, how you measure, how you kind of go through the valley of death as you develop your product. The valley of um, death. Yes, and then I think one of, the, one of the big challenges is you exist in an ecosystem in which there still are t-shirts being sold for less than 10 pounds or 10 dollars. And I'm not convinced that you can um, ethically do that. I'm not sure that you can pay properly um, and I don't think that you can properly um, uh, source the environmental impact if you're producing stuff at that price point. And I think the challenge, um, <laughs> and, 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 and I think the, ch the challenge for us is that if clothes are regarded as consumables um, and discardables, um, and your business model is predicated on that, then um, the, the, the impact, both in social terms and labor terms and ethical terms and environmental terms, is not just deleterious. Um, it affects the ecosystem of other brands who are trying to struggle through, who are smaller, who perhaps don't have the resources, because there are always this reversion to a lowest common denominator of brands which don't fully take into account the externalities of what they do, either in terms of labor or in terms of the environment. And I think for as long as that model exists unchallenged, and as long as we as, and I don't think it's just, it's too easy in my view to set, put this on consumers until consumers stop, because the things get produced, um, and I think there has to be a sense that we're going to stop producing in this way and at this price point, and I think it will then create an ecosystem of brands that across the board are able to grow and flourish. Okay. Do you think then that, and I'm going to throw this to everyone on the panel, do we need to be more transparent about the kind of big picture vision of the fashion industry as being maybe one where overproduction is a problem? Is rife? I mean, choose your words. Anyone? <laughs> no one. I'm, ha I'm happy to speak. I can keep <laughs> speaking. I mean, look at light bulbs, right? There was a, p a point in the world in which light bulbs had planned obsolescence. We bought cheap light bulbs and they were designed to fail. So we bought too many of the light bulbs. And, and then it became morally unacceptable to produce those cheap light bulbs. So we started producing light bulbs that lasted longer. We paid a little bit more for them, but net net as a consumer, we were better off. And the impact on the environment was hands down better. So there has to be a way in which the producers of these goods come to a consensus that you won't produce at that level. It can still be, you can still deliver clothes to people that are net-net, better for them economically, last longer, but also support an ecosystem of brands which are trying to do a similar thing. Okay, good stuff. I just want to now wrap this up by asking, everyone, how are we going to work together and collaborate to produce a more transparent industry? Might just ask you all, what's the one thing that you would pick that we should be working on in order to do that, Carrie? I think the one thing is that we need um, greater regulation. We have to have a level playing field to get the laggards to move. In the Fashion Transparency Index this year, a third of brands scored between 0 and 10%, and 12 brands scored 0%. So without having um, more regulation, brands are just going to continue to publish whatever information they want to, and in whatever format they determine best. So greater regulation is, okay. is the key. Karen, what, what would be your pick of what we need to work on here? I mean, for us, it's really been a... We're looking very much about on integrity, on, on, on relevance, what is relevant actually for our customers and what is verified information and also on consistency. Those are like the three things that I really um, look at when we are talking about this topic. And, and uh, we really look forward to, uh, to a, um, a standard, an in index and, and a standard that will uh, make this information uh, comparable because 
then I think it will also be both relevant and understandable. And I think that's what consumers out there are waiting for. Yeah, absolutely. Baptiste? I cannot agree more. <laughs> so that's uh, definitely what we need to be able to accelerate the movement and to make that really happen. It's a common language. It's a common one language to be able to make the measurement. It's a common language that manufacturers, brand retailer, can talk in the same way about their performance and that ultimately this information can be given to the consumers. We cannot be in a world where trans sustainability information can be vehicle in a different way from store A to store B when you walk in downtown city. Yeah. So it has to be communicated in one single way and that will be definitely the real enabler of transparency. So common language. Common language. Rachel, the yeah, last I word. Mean, I think for me, you know, this idea of collaboration is a no brainer. This is just the simple notion that tides rise, right? You know, the more people that are involved, but I would really push just the this notion of innovation, thinking about experimentation, getting out there, giving it a go, and loads of people in this room are obviously doing that, and I would just insist that you keep doing so and not forget the fact that whilst we're all very established industry players in terms of the kind of brands in the room, there, are, there is this whole swathe of direct-to-consumer brands that are coming up really fast at your heels and are doing a phenomenal job about thinking around transparency, sustainability, and all the rest, and they're winning the consumer's hearts really, really fast, so if you don't act, someone else is going to do it for you. We're back to Simon's suggestion. Do, aren't we? Do. <laughs> We're out of time. Now, I'm afraid we didn't get a chance to ask any questions that you had sent through. I would really encourage you to approach the panelists afterwards and ask those questions and continue this conversation beyond the stage. And I would like to thank so very much our esteemed and very generous panelists for sharing their insights today. Thank you. Thank you.